It had been a long spring. The snowdrops had been and went, and the blossom had since moved on till next spring. Summer was just around the corner from the miniature railway, and with it more passengers and tourists to travel on the little line. For a while, things have been very quiet for the railway, which for some can be fine, while others find it pretty dull. Casey and Whitehouse were among these groups. Our story begins with them at the station, taking a break from their morning trains. Casey busied himself as usual by tinkering with his engine Lady Grange, while Whitehouse busied himself with a crossword puzzle in the railway's newsletter. He chewed the end of his pencil as he pondered a missing section. I tell you what, these crosswords the chairman puts into these newsletters gets harder and harder every month, he commented. Ugh. Then cursed under his breath as he wrongly filled in the section. Where are you stuck? asked Casey. Twenty-four down, eight letters. And the clue? Overgrown, confused, and losing the way initially, but ends up in charge. Casey raised his head from the cab and stared blankly. Governor, he said shortly. Pardon? That's what it is. Governor. Whitehouse checked it, and was surprised at how well it fitted in, and because of it, he was able to answer a few others. Wow! <laughs> okay, um, how, how did you know that's what it meant? Simple. It's an anagram of the word overgrown, but without the W, it's lost away initially, you see? W being the first letter of way. I see. Hmm, said Whitehouse, quite impressed. Well, there's that, hesitated Casey, or the fact that I saw the answers for that crossword when I was collecting the engine shed keys. Ah, so you didn't use your general knowledge then. <laughs> More like my common sense, Casey laughed. Anything new that we ought to be aware of? Any reports on this year's steam fair? Not at the moment. Uh, let's see. Uh, nothing about the steam fair, just this news about new parts arriving next week, uh, the present eviction of Mr. B. Williams, and this article on why it's a good idea to use Arctic birch plywood for making driving truck bodies. Casey turned around suddenly. What'd you say there just now? The usage of Arctic birch plywood? No, 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 before that. The eviction of Mr. B. Williams from prison. What's got you worked up on that for? That name. I remember that name. But from where? Casey began tapping the edge of his head, trying to jog that memory back into the light. Yes, now I remember, he said, standing up. Do you remember our events with Betty and how she was stolen for that petrol scheme? <laughs> how can I forget, said Whitehouse, folding his newsletter and pointing to his blue hair. Go on. Well, that's the name of the person who runs the business up the road from us, the Motorcar Society. He's a nasty piece of work, and I've heard rumours that he's been trying to close the society down to build a car factory on top of it. Well, why would anyone want to do a thing like that? Well, you haven't met him in person. I have. He smokes these cigars that give off the most foulest of fumes. Oh, I tell you, it'll all be hell let loose if he ever sits fit here again. Which will be sooner than you think, came a voice. The two looked round and saw the two boys that appeared behind them with grim expressions. Sorry, no trains running at the moment, said Whitehouse. We're not here to ride those little tinker toys, the tall one said, in a voice that sounded like an angle grinder. We're more interested in closing this place down, like your friend just mentioned. Casey leaned against Lady Grange's cab and sighed. Grinder and gears, I wondered when the next time we'd meet would be. Still slaving up in that garage of yours? Or at least it pays the bills every week, Gears said. Casey raised an eyebrow inquisitively. Gears hesitated. Well, whenever they do get paid. But that's beside the point. We're just here to let you know that the boss will be returning shortly, and he will make sure you lot are out of here. But what do you mean, out of here? asked Whitehouse. <laughs> Is it obvious? said Grinder with a laugh. The boss has big plans for this place when he gets back. He's been telling us all about it in his letters. As soon as he's back in command, added Gears, our world-famous vehicles will send you folks out on your arses, engines and all. <laughs> what do you think of that, Smurfhead? Hearing this remark, Whitehead advanced grimly forward. Well, I'd like to see you try it, he said threateningly, but Casey stopped him before he went any further. You'll just be wasting your time on these two, he explained. Yeah, smiles Gears cheekily. No point wasting time knocking seven bells out of us, eh? But Casey just smiled. No, no, no. You see, if you knock seven bells out of them now, they won't be in a suitable condition for when their boss returns to do the same thing. Grinder and Gears' grins dropped. You see, continued Casey, with all that time in prison, he's probably wondering how you two are managing the business. 
He has left somebody in charge, hmm? There is the sound of shuffling feet on the tarmac. And he'll also want to know how many vehicles you managed to sell. Those world-famous ones that you so happen to mention. We would be selling our stock if your silly little railway wasn't taking all the customers, yelled Grinder. Oh, what's wrong? A bit of competition getting the better of you, teased Whitehouse. Grinder raised a finger in protest. One of these days, your railway will cease operating, and we'll be the ones who brings in the customers. <laughs> like that'll be the day, scoffed Casey. He looked over their shoulders and notices some people coming towards them. Now, if you two have finished your threats, perhaps myself and my friend here can get back to our work. Uh, tickets, ma'am? Yes, just in that cabin over there, if you please. Thank you. As the train moved off, both Casey and Whitehouse gave the snarling brothers a smug grin as they rounded the curve and into the forest. Oh, it just makes my blood boil when they do things like that, growled Grinder, mocking us with their little toy railway. We'll work something out, bro, said Gears, patting Grinder on the back. Come on, we best go back before the boss returns. He's not going to be too pleased about it all. They began making their way up the road to a section where the trees seemed to have nearly lost all their leaves, while ones that remained were slowly turning brown. The air grew thick with exhaust fumes as the two proceeded through a rusty iron gateway below a sign which read, Motor Car Society Limited, established 1972. As they strolled through the cluttered courtyards where old crocs stood rusting away, they noticed the familiar custom-made Rolls-Royce convertible of the Society's founder, Bernard Martin Williams. Some years ago, Bernard was arrested for producing illegal black market petrol within the grounds, and was also charged for his other black market dealings. He stated in the court that his petrol was the future of all other forms of fuel in the auto industry, and that no harm would come to those who used it. However, the evidence of what happens when this fuel is used proved to be more than necessary. Reports of vehicles running on this fuel spontaneously combusting the second the ignition was turned on, while others showed the horrific results should anyone ever made contact with the stuff. If you remember the story, Whitehouse fell into a vat of this petrol on the day Bernard was charged, but the mixture was not fully formed, so as a result the only change he encountered was the changing of his hair colour from brown to blue. An oil-stained finger tapped Grinder on the shoulder. He turned and looked at the scruffy-looking employee, busy excavating a mound of earwax from his left ear. He wants to see you two now, he said gruffly. He has a few questions regarding how things were going while he was away. I hope you have plenty of excuses. The boys gulped as they looked up towards the office window that overlooks the whole site. A dark silhouetted figure could be seen through the slits of the roller blinds before they were snapped shut, making both men jump in terror. Well, we, we best go and see what he wants, gulped Gears as they gingerly ascended the metal stairway leading up to the office. Enter. Gears was just about to knock before Bernard's gravelly growl came from the other side of the door. Like two scared puppies, the brothers quietly made their way inside. The room was dimly lit, with the blinds closed, but they could just make out the layout of the room. Filing cabinets stood untouched, with paperwork shoved in so hard that no amount of tugging on the drawer handle would prise it open. A clock ticked on the wall nearby. Each tick sounded like the many firearms being cocked before an execution could take place. And there was the desk. The famous desk where all the schemes and deals were plotted out, one by one. And then, behind the desk, was blackness. A shadow formed within shadows, not revealing what lurked within. Then, a faint red glow formed followed by a plume of thick olive green smoke, forming a cloud which joined the many which hovered around the room. While inside, Bernard had to settle for standard cigarettes that he got from the other inmates, but they weren't anything compared to his own branded cigars. The tobacco was imported in vast amounts to a private firm where they were mass-produced and delivered by the day in large crits. If you ever met Bernard, the first thing that stays in your mind are his cigars. It wasn't that the smell was bad, but the plaster on the office walls reverted back to its powder form upon first contact with any vapours. What it did to Bernard's lungs, no doctor could find a medical definition to describe it. But one thing about these cigars that can be for certain, in Bernard's case anyways, was that they were very addictive. 
So addicted, in fact, that when the brothers reported to his office to welcome him back, Bernard had already finished off his 20th packet that morning. Well, 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 if it ain't the brothers grim. Bernard's voice came from within the darkness. G good to see you back with us again, sir, quavered Grinder. It hasn't been the same without you. There was a long pause. The amber glow remained glowing in the shadows. No, it hasn't. Bernard sat up, revealing his grim expression. Which is why this business hasn't made any money at all. And what, I dare ask, were you two playing at while I was inside? Stealing toy models to sell off? Oh yes, I got word of it when I heard that you two were caught making a break for it. I was surprised Mary bothered to pay for your bail. She needed somebody to yell at while Dad was doing his share of time, muttered Gears. The memory of his mum yelling at him still hadn't left his system. Um, how is Dad, by the way, sir? They moved him to a solitary confinement after he swung a right hook at the chef. Was he threatening him? He didn't put any salt in the taters. Ah, <laughs> uh, he always likes his taters with plenty of salt, chuckles Gears. Hmm... And he's saving a right hook for you two after I told him about your little scheme, Bernard said, getting back on topic. It was only to tie things over until we can make a sale, sir, Grinder insisted. Which won't happen anytime soon now that Railway Society is in operation. Every minute in my cell, I swore to get even with those railway brats if it's the last thing I do. My petrol scheme was perfect without fail. That is until they came and ruined it for me. And what's worse is that they also got their hands on the one thing that helped us get through our tough times. What? Cars. And before any of you two say it, I'm referring to Mark Carson. Yes, that Mark Carson. I can see from your expressions the memories of him are coming back to you. Never before had I seen such leadership. He made sure we were ahead of the game and even made plans to ensure the railway failed. Ooh, if we could relive those times again, we would be back in business. The trouble is that the railway is taking in more customers than we did, said Gears. Then we'll just have to find ways of making them fail, Bernard snapped, slamming his fist on the table. He steadied himself and puffed steadily on a cigar. All I want to do right now is give those other railway pests a piece of my mind, grumbled Grinder. Especially after what they said to us this morning, they should be the ones that should fail instead of the railway. Bernard sat up and looked at Grinder with interest. Tell me, who are these other railway pests you speak of? Two drivers, Gears explained. The short one we saw working that engine we stole for the petrol scheme. The other had a punk-like shade of hair that you can't miss in a crowd. Two drivers, eh? Murdered Bernard to himself. He pressed his intercon at the side of his desk. The buzzer outside the office sounded, alerting his secretary. Rachel, contact our hackers and get them to source me a copy of the Model Engineer Society's employee list. I'd like to know more about these two drivers. Jane Wilkinson was finding her time at the railway to be quite busy. There was no end to work, preparing teas, sorting out deliveries, as well as making some of her famous pastries. She also has time to talk, and sometimes listens to some of the stories the other members of the society talk about. Sometimes she would eavesdrop on a conversation that took her interest. In this case, it was cars getting an earful from one of the workshop attendants. November lady, I've got evidence. November lady isn't in the 4.30. It wasn't the 4.30, it was the 3.30. It was October lad. It wasn't October lad, it was November lady. Now listen, if you and the others have put it all on October lad, I'll sue you. Oh, you will, will you? I know you're higher rank than me, but if you ever so reach the age of 90, and you can't tell the difference between a lad and a lady, you're a funny assity, you hear me? A funny assity! And before Cars could put another word in, they left, leaving him standing by the doorway, open-mouthed. Trouble, Mark? Cars walked over and leaned against the counter in disbelief. He thinks I've conned him, saying the November Lady was the horse of the syndicate. October Lad is what it was. Actually, it was November Lady, said Jane. It just came through there on the radio. Apparently, there was a mix-up in the numbering of the horses. Cars sighed heavily. Well, that's going to be difficult to explain later on. Cup of tea, please, Jane. Has Casey been in yet? Uh, not yet. He should be in after the lunchtime run. Oh, wait, I can see him and Whitehouse coming over now. Here's your tea. 
Katie dusted off some ash from his cap before hanging it on its spot behind the door. Ooh, another shift done until the next hour, he said, stretching. Two cream teas, please, Jane. Uh, Case, I've got you down for Friday from two to four. You're all right to cover that. If you spare me an hour on Thursday, I should be able to. I promised I'd help Cliff with his steam test. Um, Casey tells me that Bernard Williams has been released today, said White House. The car is nearly choked on his scone. Watch out, cried Casey. You're spitting crumbs into my tea. He's, he's what? Cars exclaimed. Yeah, didn't you not read this morning's newsletter? I hadn't even got the chance. What with this private group coming on Friday? I'm lucky to even get this cup of tea. And placing bets on the wrong horses, teased Jane, refilling his cup. Cars pretended he hadn't heard. I just hope he doesn't find out I'm working here now. He muttered quietly. Well, I doubt it, said White House. Then thought for a moment before saying, Mind you, we have been doing really well recently with you in second command. And so we should after all the trouble I've caused you in the past, Cars answered, before being hushed quickly by Casey. Listen, it's best no one knows about that event, he whispered quietly, so Jane or anyone else with an earshot could hear. Nobody knows about what happened to Betty when you... acquired her for Bernard's scheme. And we'd like to keep that out of the record books for as long as possible. Cars knew what Casey meant, and gave a nod to show that he understood quite clearly. I only mentioned it, continued Whitehouse, because I'm wondering if it would cause some suspicion with them. I mean, I don't think we've become this popular since then. Mm, you might have a point there, mused Cars. Then shrugged off the thought. Nah, besides, we're a working example for the rail galleries at the museum, so I'd say that would be the real reason. Well, I suppose so. Oh yes, uh, we also saw two of Bernard's workers before we did that last run. Uh, Grinder and Gears, I think their names were. Ye gods, are they still working there? Questioned Cars. Then again, there is some family connection with them and Bernard. Can't remember what, though. Mm, but best keep an eye on them should you ever see them again. In my time working for Bernard, I noticed they can be very determined when it comes to carrying out one of their tasks. I'm sure we'll be very careful, smiled Casey. He stood up and went over to the counter. Uh, could you pour a cup out for corpse, Jane? I'm just heading over to the workshops now. I'm sure you could do with one. Uh, sure thing. Give me a sec. What time is this group coming on Friday? Asked White House. Uh, one o'clock, but I'd say there'll be more of them arriving later on. Just make a note to have Esther coach stock ready just in case. Here's that tea case, said Jane. Oh, thanks, Jane. I'll see you guys later on. Casey paused at the doorway before turning and gave cars a wink. By the way, I heard November Lady did very well in the 3.30. Oh, get out of my sight, snapped Cars. Whitus and Jane simply smiled. Casey raced through the grounds of the Motorcar Society, dodging past stacks of old oil drums that blocked his path. As he ran past them, each of them burst open, sending jets of exhaust fumes which formed memories, recounting the events of the lost engine. His first meeting with Bernard, cars threatening him at gunpoint, and how he shot Whitehouse from the gantry over the petrol heating vats. He tried to run from these memories, but could feel himself being tethered and pulled back to act like the whole scene like a puppet. He felt himself being pulled up by his strings to find Grinder holding the control rods, while Gears produced a pair of scissors from within his cap. With one snap, the strings were cut, and Casey fell rapidly from his great height, making towards a smoldering petrol vat ready to claim him. He felt a bang, and then silence. Casey raised his head and looked around. The wind howled outside his bedroom window, while his bedside clock ticked the hour of 2 a.m. He picked himself off the floor, unwrapped the bedsheets that were constricting his arms and torso, and climbed back into bed. The thoughts of the past were still getting to him, and he only hoped that nothing like it would happen again any time soon. Whitehouse was also having trouble sleeping. He too was thinking about the events of the lost engine, and thought back to when he fell into the vat of petrol. He could remember the slight burning on his skin, and almost mistaking the red dye seeping away from his shirt for his own blood. If Cars hadn't quickly added water into the vat when he fell, he would have had a much more scarring outcome. He stared at the permanent status of his hair in the bathroom mirror, and thanked the heavens he got off lightly. He made himself a hot drink and listened to a chapter of an audiobook before turning in.